she's like really like powerful and she makes like majority of the money she's hardworking. she's always busy and he is not so busy and feeling like a little bit inferior and just tired of his wife always working all the time and so he starts an affair with a woman at the couple's at like the his wife and his cabin in the woods and then the woman that he's having an affair with comes up unalive to like she's in that cabin and so obviously he gets arrested for it because duh and then now his wife has to defend him and get him off which like I said in the last video he would be going to jail um no you're going to jail I don't care if you did it or not I'm just kidding sort of <laughs> so in the last video we did chapter one and that was in wife's point of view. I believe her name is Sarah, right? Yeah, her name is Sarah, and it basically was just like an intro to it. I'll link that video below, but just showing their relationship of how she's always busy. They're supposed to go to their cabin for their anniversary, their 10-year anniversary, and instead, she's going to work, and he's not so happy about it, but it honestly seems like he really loves her, so like the vibes aren't giving cheater vibes, but you know, I could be wrong. So, let's just get into chapter two, which I believe is in his point of view. I'm excited. I've been dying to read this book for the past two weeks, so let's get into it. Also, it got a little bit spicy in the last one, and I'm a little bit scared that I might get spicy today because this one's from his point of view, and he's uh, the one having the affair. So, just a little disclaimer, it might get spicy. Chapter 2, we are in his point of view. My fingers tap against the keyboard for a few more times just as the sun is leaving its final stretch of light on this side of the world for the day. A breeze rustles the trees, shaking them of their fall-colored leaves, while laps of lake water gently lick the shore. Okay. I save the work I've done for the day and close my laptop. 3,000 words will have to do. I toss my black rimmed reading glasses onto the desk and run my hands through my ash brown hair, pushing it off my forehead. I rub my temples a bit to alleviate a lingering tension headache and let out a deep sigh. As I stretch my arms out and roll my neck, a black squirrel darting across the yard catches my eye. It's not as if I haven't seen a black squirrel before, but it's a rare sight and demands to be watched and noticed. I stare out of the large window behind my desk as the creature bounces from place to place searching for food, complete in its sense of purpose and direction. The lake house is an hour away from our home outside of DC and it might as well be on a new planet. It's a verdant land that our forefathers would actually recognize. Unlike the concrete and horn blasted monstrosity that plays the part of our nation's capital. The house isn't far enough from the city to ensure no unexpected visitors, but close enough for me to travel to whenever I need to be alone, or not alone for that matter. Don't do it! A secluded cabin on Lake Manassas, surrounded by woods in Prince William County, Virginia, was just what my writing career needed. Or at least, that's how I sold the idea to Sarah. I had struggled to get the words out up until just over a year ago when we purchased the second home. It opened another world for me, a world in which I could write, or a world full of obtainable desires, a world I could live in without feeling the constant pressure that I wasn't good enough. The natural beauty of the environment around me could be reflected into my work, and in this world I felt reborn. Hardwood features so heavily in the makeup of our lake house that it feels like you've climbed inside a tree rather than a human dwelling. The wide open living area has large bay windows overlooking the lake and a massive fireplace adorned with various colored stones. A huge bearskin rug completes the sitting area and serves as a central point that separates it from the kitchen. Forest green marble granite covers both the kitchen island and the countertops, and above and below are pine cabinets that have been stained to a rich, almost caramel-colored wood. 
just off the sitting area, less than 10 feet from the fireplace, over by the bay windows, sits my desk. This allows me the perfect view of all that nature has to offer in this neck of the woods and gives me the freedom of not feeling trapped in some small office. It didn't take much to convince Sarah that we should purchase this home away from home. I think she could sense that I was drifting away, mentally and emotionally. Or maybe she just wanted to show me that she could buy it, to remind me once again of her physical hold over me, wielding it as a show of power. Ooh, that's toxic mindset. Whatever that reason may be, I still got the house, so who fucking cares? I'm curious, do you guys think that I should read the book as is, or do you think I should like change some stuff when it gets a little bit spicy or like too like vulgar let me know what you think because i don't know i'm like torn between reading it as is and like changing it also if you hear background noise they're mowing the line randomly so just ignore it it was supposed to be our home away from home but it turns out it's just my home I've lost count of the number of times Sarah promised she'd come with me for a weekend, but later canceled. This weekend was no exception, even on our 10th anniversary. I had hoped she'd make it down just for the day, but she phoned earlier telling me she had to go into the office once again. She also told me she loved me. She always tells me she loves me. I hold my wrist out admiring my new watch. It's beyond expensive. Despite the cost, it was still a thoughtful gift. That's Sarah for you. She is thoughtful, even if she's never around. <clears throat> the lighting changes, you guys. I'm so sorry. I'm trying to work on my lighting. If you have any tips, help me, please. I've always felt like Sarah was taking on the world while I was struggling to live in it. That's the woman she wanted to be, a powerhouse, a one-woman show where I just happened to be cast as an extra. It wasn't always like that. We met while I was in my third year of undergrad at Duke and she was in her first. She was studying political science while I was studying literature. Literature. Back then, we both dreamed of greatness. Sarah wanted to be a successful lawyer and I wanted to go down as one of the truly great writers of our generation. Fifteen years later, one of us is still waiting. Ugh. Well, I suppose success flickered for me for a moment and went away just as quickly and has yet to come back again. That's the funny thing about dreams. You always eventually wake up from them. My first book was a success, not from a mainstream or commercial standpoint, but from a literary perspective. One critic even called me the next David Foster Wallace, which I liked. The book has a nice cult following to this day, and I thought I'd duplicate that success. But books two and three have flopped by all standards, literary included. But books two and three have flopped by all standards, literary included. I'm surprised my agent has kept me on, and I'm sure if the book I'm working on isn't a success, I'll be getting the axe soon enough. I've tasted a small sampling of triumph, but I haven't exactly lived out my dreams. Sarah's dream was to be a criminal defense attorney, one of the best. She's not one of the best. She is the best. Literally, like I always knew she would be. I just never thought I'd resent her so much for it. Okay, you guys, I don't like him because he's a cheater. But I definitely understand the feeling of this. Like, I, 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 I get it. I get why he did it. Not that it's right, because it's definitely not. Especially when you've been with someone for 10 years. Like, babe, just speak up if you're not happy. But... I do, like, I, I understand, you know, it sucks, but like I said, it wasn't always like this, and when I say this, I mean running off to our second home, any chance I get, and her practically taking up residency at her office. After all, you don't become the best criminal defense attorney by loving your husband. 
one would think that living in solitude and wallowing in my own self-pity would make me one of the great writers, like a modern-day Thoreau or Hemingway. But to date, I have all the alcohol usage of Hemingway, just none of the success to go along with it. Sarah has her work, and I have mine. And there was a time when we had each other, but that time is past. We had met at a party, a complete stroke of luck, as it was out of the norm for Sarah to attend one. She would go on to tell me later that night. She'd much rather have her face in a book than be surrounded by sticky hormonal bodies in a basement of a college house. But there she was, standing in a corner, casually sipping cheap beer out of a solo cup, looking more out of place than a nun in a brothel. She held a partial smile, trying to mask her discomfort, but her body language gave her uneasiness away. She was leaning against a wall, one leg crossed over the other, the solo cup hovering near her lips, glancing over the party. One arm crossed over her chest, tucked underneath her other arm. She was trying to make herself as small as possible, blending into the background, going unnoticed. But to me, she was the only person in that room. Her shoulder-length blonde hair was practically glowing under the black lights, a staple of any college party in the middle, in the mid-2000s. Her green eyes that were speckled with flakes of yellow held all the mystery in the world. Her slender body was covered in a form-fitting white tee and flared blue jeans. An inch of her midriff was peeking out and I couldn't keep my eyes off of it. A sliver of her exposed milky white skin aroused me more than my ex's fully nude body had. Okay. <laughs> I watched her. I studied her. That sounds creepy, dude. Okay, calm down. <laughs> Before I had ever uttered a word to her, I had memorized every curve, every line, and every freckle that I was privy to in that dingy basement. I pictured what she'd look like underneath her clothes, and I would later found out that what I had envisioned was wrong. Her body exceeded the limitations of my own imagination. She was perfect, something I could neither conceive nor comprehend. He's talking very highly of her right now. It wasn't until an hour later when her eyes fully caught mine that I worked up the courage to go and talk to her. I towered over her petite body, but right from the beginning, she always felt bigger than me, and I knew as soon as she realized it, she would be an unstoppable force. At first, she was a little standoffish, giving one-word answers. I asked her name. She told me it was Sarah. I asked her who she was here with. She pointed to an inebriated brunette grinding on a guy on the dance floor. I asked her if she wanted to dance. She said no. I told her she was beautiful. She shrugged her shoulders. She's such a queen. I told her my name was Adam. She took a sip of her beer. <laughs> I like her. I don't know. I asked her what she was studying. She tapped her beer, signaling she needed a refill, and started to walk away. Oh my god. I grabbed her cup and poured my full cup of beer into hers. She smiled up at me, taking the cup back and returning her position against the wall. Smooth, she said as she took a sip. Not me falling for him. This is why I can't read romance books because I literally fall in love with these people. I leaned against the wall next to her and we stood in silence for what seemed like hours. Right from the beginning with Sarah, it always felt like forever. She casually sipped her beer while she scanned the party and kept an eye on her drunk friend. I pretended to study the room with her, but my only focus was on her. At minute 19, Sarah's friend told her she was leaving with the guy she had been grinding on all night. Her words slurred, her eyes glazed over, and her hair fell in front of her face as she held on to the hand of the man she would soon spread herself apart for. Sir, what are you... <laughs> Why are you describing it like that? Calm down. Sarah didn't seem pleased, but she told her to have a good time and to call her in the morning. It was the most I had heard her speak all night. Sarah remained composed, casual. 
casually sipping her beer. At minute 20, she finished her drink and dropped the cup into the dirty basement floor, kicking it into a corner. She stood there a little longer, her eyes bounced around the party and then to the side of me. She shifted a little uneasy and I wasn't sure if she was moving toward me or away from me. At minute 21, I decided to find out and I asked her if she wanted to get out of here. She said yes. When I got her safely back to her dorm room, I expected to give her a kiss on the cheek and tell her goodnight. Sarah didn't seem like the kind of girl to give into her impulses. As I went in for a small peck on the cheek, she pulled me inside, ripped off my clothes, and she puffed and gasped breaths of yes for the rest of the night. <laughs> I'm gonna read that again for the people that didn't hear me. <laughs> Wait a second. <laughs> As I went in for a small peck on the cheek, she pulled me inside, ripped off my clothes, and she puffed and gasped breaths of yes for the rest of the night. Okay. Good for you, girl. <laughs> Three years later, I asked her to marry me, and she said yes again. And although she had said yes to me countless times since then, I think that was the last time she truly meant it. If she hadn't been consumed with law school and then practicing law, I think we would have been. And then it cuts out. The brace sucks the front door closed with a slam. It startles me just for a split second, but I know it's her. Without even seeing her, I know her freckles are prominent from a day working the outside patio at the cafe. So this is the mistress. I know her brown, doe eyes are lit up, filled with hope and joy. I know her long, tousled hair sits underneath a hat she knitted herself earlier this fall. I know when she pulls that hat off, she'll still look effortlessly beautiful, messy hair and all. I know she'll, she'll be braless, wearing a form-fitting top and a dark thigh-length skirt. I know the waist of her shirt will be creased from where her apron sat all day. I know she'll smile when she sees me, and it'll take me less than six. six <clears throat> I know she'll smile when she sees me, and it'll take me less than sixty seconds to be inside her. brought leftover baked goods from the cafe. She calls from the foyer, from the foyer. <laughs> I hear her rustle her shoes, kneeling socks, and jacket off. I pull two glasses from the wet bar. I pour scotch into each glass, and just as she enters, I have one drink outreach to her. With a little bounce in her step, she takes the glass from me, chucks it, and sets it back down on the wet bar. The heat from the stone fireplace warms her skin, and I notice the goosebumps on her arms flatten. Before I can take a second sip, she's unbuttoning and unzipping my pants. She drops to her knees and looks up at me with a devilish grin. The nerve of this man, okay? I was trying to, like, understand him a little bit, but, like, how dare you? In the, in the house that your wife bought the level of disrespect. I can't. Oh, wait. Wait, I think it's getting sweaty, y'all. I'm scared. Okay, let's just... <clears throat> let's just see where it goes. <laughs> I drop her legs on the bed and walk into the bathroom, closing the door behind me. Okay, we skip the smut. I'm actually kind of happy about that because I don't know if I can handle all that right now. <sighs> okay. <laughs> I can still hear her panting from the other side of the door, trying to regain control of her own breathing. She doesn't make a sound, and I assume she's still lying there. I hope it's in ecstasy and not pain. Sometimes I take things too far. It's like I black out when I come to... I realize the error of my ways. I can't help myself. Kelly just does that to me. Okay, so the mistress name is Kelly. When I'm with her, my animal instincts take over. That is so icky. Okay. 
can never get enough of me and I can't get enough of her, but I know that won't always be true. There was a time that Sarah and I couldn't get enough of each other either. That time passed long ago. Occasionally, those feelings resurface, but they're short-lived and usually in induced by alcohol or time apart. Don't get me wrong, I love Sarah. If I didn't, I would have left her long ago. It's that love that I hold on to, not the money, the security, or the houses. Kelly gives me the love that Sarah can no longer. They both complete me. Oh my god. It's sick. I know, but it's true. I need them both. Y'all. I thought that this was just like an affair. Like, don't tell me that he's in love with this woman. Do not tell me that he's in love with this woman because... Are you going to tell your wife about us? Are you going to tell your husband about us? She's married too. She's married too. Just throw them both in jail at this point. I'll read that again. <laughs> Are you going to tell your wife about us? Are you going to tell your husband about us? I retort. She huffs and holds her arms across her chest. It's not the same. Her words are quiet. I leave and return with two full glasses of scotch, handing one to her and taking a seat. I put one arm around her and pull her close, telling her I know. She lets out a soft, silent sob. As quickly as the cry left her body, she pulls it back in, regaining her composure. She takes a large gulp of the scotch and doesn't even flinch at the burn. She leans into me. We sit there in silence, drinking our glasses of scotch, trapped in the loveless marriages where we come second to the people we love. When Kelly and I are together, we come first. I refill our glasses twice more, and then we have sex again. This time, I don't. F U C K K her. I make love to her. Honestly, you guys, the reason that I spelled it out that time versus when I said it the other time was because it just meant two different things and when it's said in that way that seems a little bit too vulgar for me you know so I had to spell it out <sighs> but that's chapter two y'all honestly like I want to read another one <laughs> but I'm not going to but I do want to first of all jail jail for both of them they're both married. Are you kidding me? We got a little bit of also background information on how they met, which was honestly kind of cute. But then, y'all, there's nothing more that I hate more than a cheater. Like, I don't know what it is about cheating. That shit just really, like, that shit really, like, gets under my skin when it comes to cheating. Like, it really, it really it really pisses me off. Um, and I thought that it was just like a, I'm just sleeping with this woman, like nothing else. Like I love my wife because he seemed like he really loved his wife in the first chapter. But like, it seems like he loves this woman too. Like at the end, he said this time he didn't have to sneak her. He made love to her. Excuse me. Excuse me. And then him, like, having his mistress read the text messages. That is so disrespectful. You know what? I'm never getting married. I'm never dating. I'm gonna be single forever because if a man ever does this to me, I'm gonna cry. <laughs> Because this wasn't relaxing for me. My emotions are up here. 